everyone. So I'm Ralph Potter at Copley. I work on bringing machine learning to heterogeneous processes using SQL. Um, so we're really interested in how do we get from these higher level programming models like Python, so here we've got some TensorFlow code, down to hardware, so whether that's FPGAs, whether that's GPUs, DSPs, or, or what have you. Um, so I'm gonna cover some of the challenges of accelerating machine learning on heterogeneous hardware. I'm gonna talk a, a bit about OpenCL and SQL and our work to bring OpenCL support to TensorFlow. And this is primarily a talk about engineering and not so much a talk about machine learning theory. So machine learning today is being used to solve a wide range of problems that are challenging or impossible to solve with just conventional imperative programming. So it performs really well at something like vision processing, where it might be really hard to hand code a whole series of features to detect whatever we regard as the particular properties of a cat or a dog or what have you. Lots of machine learning algorithms are really computationally intensive, so that makes putting them on GPUs or other accelerators really attractive. But at the same time, there's a wide variety of hardware out there that people want to target with machine learning, whether it's supercomputers, all the way down to smartphones, DSPs, really tiny devices, and also really large power-hungry devices. And with so many devices to target, getting this done in a productive way without producing hundreds of implementations is a challenging problem. So machine learning is a field that's evolving really rapidly. We see new papers every day, new operators, new neural network layers. We also see new hardware appearing incredibly quickly. And so we need some kind of stability. If we're, if we're developing uh, new operators and new algorithms, we need to be able to put them on something without also chasing new hardware at the same time. Um, so we need a programming model that gives us a point of stability in the middle. So today there's already a plethora of machine learning frameworks out there targeted at data and domain scientists, whether it's TensorFlow or CAFE or PyTorch. And the users of these frameworks are not typically systems programmers, they're not typically parallel programmers, and they're not typically interested in dealing with the nitty gritty of how do I make something fast on a GPU, how do I make something fast on a DSP or an FPGA. Um, they're building models as computational graphs and they want that to be accelerated on whatever hardware they have. So th these frameworks have high level interfaces, typically Python, but internally they're typically implemented in languages like C++. There's a lot of CUDA for GPU compute. And these frameworks are often large. TensorFlow is somewhere in the region of 700 plus operators. So if we were to look at TensorFlow on CUDA today to give us an idea of the architecture, users are coding against Python or against C++. That's what they're writing their applications in. This is all going through a static C API that exists for TensorFlow. And then inside TensorFlow itself, we find a whole series of uh, kernels, specialized matrix multiply and convolution operators that are either built on the eigenlinear algebra library for the majority of operators, or are, full, or are going back to NVIDIA's CUDNN for hand-coded optimizations. Which, this is fine if what you want to do is target an NVIDIA device, they, they've shipped a great kind of software stack there, but what happens if we want to target something else? Well, we lose CUDNN, we lose Eigen unless we find some way to compile the C++, and so we have this gap between the C API and whatever our specialized hardware is. So to move on to OpenCL, 
OpenCL gives us a parallel programming model that can address a wide range of hardware. And it gives us functional portability across these devices. I can write my kernels on, test them on one device, put them on another device, and I know that they will execute. It doesn't guarantee us performance portability, which we'll come back to later, but we can guarantee that functionally we can transfer it. And that gives us some degree of stability against changes in the hardware underneath our code. So moving on from OpenCL, we have Sickle, which is a higher level specification built on top of OpenCL. So this is a specification expressed in C++ that allows us to write all of our code in a single source file, um, interleaving both our accelerated code that we might put on a GPU or a DSP and our host code to control it. The SQL framework will manage our data movement for us. Um, and it also, by virtue of being C++, brings us template metaprogramming and allows us to do things like template specialization to deal with those cases where the performance might not be portable. We can always extract the small kernel of code that is not necessarily portable from a GPU to a CPU and specialize just that and leave the rest of the surrounding code intact. Also, Sickle is based on offline compilation, unlike OpenCLC. That allows us to do all sorts of strong type checking between our host code that we're going to compile down to the host processor and the code that we're going to run on the device. So by virtue of Sickle building on top of OpenCL, that means we can execute it on a huge range of platforms, whether that's CPUs or GPUs, accelerators, FPGAs, DSPs. So as far as Sickle is concerned, we expect end users to write applications. Maybe they target Sickle directly, but more likely perhaps they just use a C++ template library that builds upon Sickle. Sickle in turn builds upon OpenCL, and that allows us to target this wide range of devices while still allowing users to just use a familiar template library or to write their own code just against Sickle's interfaces. In terms of machine learning, if we look at the same diagram, we've got data and domain scientists working in Python, targeting TensorFlow, which replaces our template library in the previous, um, the previous diagram. And that's just building from Sickle down to OpenCL, down to the accelerators that we mentioned before. So here we have a, a really minimal example of a piece of Sickle code. We simply declare a queue that says this points to our accelerator and it's going to enable us to put work on the accelerator. We declare a couple of buffers, just some, some memory that, that might exist on the CPU, it might exist on the accelerator. The Sickle runtime will move it around in the most efficient way for your computation. And then here we submit a block of work to the queue. Um, Internally, we request access to our buffers, so we're requesting read access and write access to our buffers. And then this small block of code down here is our actual compute kernel, still expressed in C++, still expressed in the same file. We get strong type safety, we get automatic data movement, and we get this nice kind of terse syntax. So. Sickle relies upon separating storage and access. So all of, our code, all of our data that we want to put on our GPU or that we want to manipulate anywhere in the runtime, we just put it in a Sickle buffer. This manages the data and it may move it according to where it's required. When we want access, we construct these accessor ob objects which essentially describe what permissions we need. So if we just want to read, we mark it as a read, and the scheduler within the SQL runtime will realize that maybe it doesn't have to move things back after a kernel has run because we didn't modify anything. Whereas if we mark it as write, the scheduler will make different decisions about moving things back to the host or back to a different uh, processor when we next require access. We use command groups to couple this, this access with compute so that this is an atomic object that says, 
all of our access requirements must be satisfied before we can run a kernel, before we can do any compute. And we could send that command group off to a CPU, or we could construct another pattern that sends it off to a GPU, and we can chain these things together and get implicit data movement simply out of the programming model as it's defined. So by constructing these accesses, that allows SQL's runtime to infer where data needs to be and when it needs to be there. So if we construct a set of buffers and we have these command groups that are going to do work for us, then if our first command group needs to read from A and write to B, and another command group needs to read from A but write to a different buffer, and a final command group needs these two buffers that we've previously written to um, before it can do its work, then our runtime is able to infer that there is a dependency between these command groups and it's able to construct that graph and do all the scheduling for you so that you don't have to. All you have to do is say, this thing requires access to this buffer and the scheduler will sort it all out and it will all just drop out of the programming model. So to get back to TensorFlow and to get back to machine learning, a huge chunk of TensorFlow is built on the Eigen Linear Algebra Library. Um, so here, we're writing mathematical expressions in terms of types defined in the Eigen Linear Algebra Library. These expressions construct new types and ultimately it constructs something that we can turn into a single kernel. So where this line simply says B times constant plus C, by virtue of the template library, and by virtue of SQL's compiler and C++'s templating system, we are able to, to lift this out and generate one single kernel that eliminates unnecessary memory accesses and gives us great performance. On top of which, this same pattern of defining maps of tensors is exactly the same pattern that is used to do the CUDA implementation of Eigen. And so we can reuse and share large portions of code between CUDA's Eigen acceleration and our SQL Eigen acceleration. And that allows us to get TensorFlow up and running much faster. So in terms of what TensorFlow looks like on open standards, We've retained the same high levels. Users are still coding in Python, they're still coding in C++ against the same unmodified API. We've managed to retain all of the Eigen tensor code that existed in the SQL backend. We've, had to, we've replaced the CUDNN layer with either kernels written in SQL, but also the option to drop in hand-coded kernels that are specific to a particular hardware vendor. So AMD have an MI open library that's hand-coded OpenCL kernels. ARM have ARM's compute library, which is another set of hand-coded kernels. Those can be dropped in, still get great performance on those platforms. And where they don't have the operators, we can still fall back to Eigen. So we retain a lot of the code that existed already in TensorFlow, but now we can bring it to SQL. And by bringing it to SQL, we can bring it to OpenCL and a huge range of hardware devices so whereas previously TensorFlow you could have run only on an NVIDIA GPU or on CPUs, we can now put it on AMD GPUs, we can now put it on embedded GPUs in things like ARM processors or Renesis's R-Car um, hardware for autonomous driving. You could put it on a DSP or a MIPS processor, various things that weren't otherwise supported so long as they have an OpenCL runtime. We can make use of SQL to translate the C++ down to that runtime and then work, run on a much wider range of hardware. So in terms of where we are today, TensorFlow itself is pretty huge. TensorFlow is some 750 operators, which on the CUDA side, there's 370 odd that makes sense to put on a GPU. And some of the operators simply don't make sense because they're doing file I.O or debugging or checkpointing, and those will never make it to the GPU. But there's some 300 to 400 that exist in the CUDA backend. So in the SQL backend, we're somewhere around 250. So maybe two thirds of, of what exists on the CUDA backend exists on SQL today. 
there's more coming every day and if they don't exist on the SQL back end then you can always fall back to the CPU implementations so everything that you can run on TensorFlow you should be able to put on SQL today and it will run most of it you'll get acceleration the rest is coming so to summarize the machine learning frameworks today are large they're complex they innovate rapidly they're heavily built on C++ for the host code. CUDA is widespread for GPU acceleration. Attempting to maintain shadow copies of all of that in OpenCLC is a really intractable or really expensive task. You're effectively saying, I'm gonna take all of these operators, I'm gonna rewrite them in OpenCLC, I'm gonna hope nobody changes the semantics, I'm gonna hope nobody introduces a new one. It's just a huge ongoing burden. But if you have a single source C++ model like SQL, you can share a lot of the code, which means that you can keep up with these changes. Because most of once you've done the glue code, almost all of the rest is just drop-in replacement. On top of which OpenCL as a, found, as a foundation of that gives us portability across a huge range of hardware. Now that's functional portability, so in most cases that works fine. If it doesn't, then because it's C++ templates, we can always go in and provide a specialization for the particular case where maybe it's not so portable. So if you imagine a matrix multiplier, I'd write that differently on a discrete GPU than a mobile GPU, but we can just provide a template specialization for both. The users never need to see it, and it's a nice clean drop-in replacement. So that covers all of my talk. Thank you.